Capitola Black Recordings presents an unabridged recording of The Lost Jewel by Charlotte Marie Tucker, or A Lady of England. Chapter 12. The Cottage Maid It was with anything but a kindly eye that Margaret watched the receding figure of the baronet, and anything but a blessing burst from her lips. She dashed the drops passionately from her eyes, and drew herself up erect as one who feels more sinned against than sinning. "'He would have flung his dirty copper to a tramp,' muttered the girl, "'but withholds from his servant her due. He turned me out of doors, turned me out at ten minutes' warning, turned me out in a burning fever, and now—well, well, the wheel's always rolling. They who are up to-day may be down to-morrow.' He may yet know what it is to ask for pity, for justice, and ask in vain. Margaret was about to quit the spot when the idea struck her that she would see what was the object in the water which had so attracted the notice of Sir John. She moved close to the brink, and looking down, she saw with her younger eyes, more plainly than the baronet had done, something that appeared like a gem entangled in the weeds below. Margaret went down on her knees by the stream, drew her sleeve above her thin elbow, and immersing her arm in the water, drew out the priceless jewel which had lain in the brook for years. The girl had none of the lapidary skill in deciding on the value of stones. Her judgment was guided by the appearance of the setting, which was of the coarsest and commonest description. "'This must have lain there for ages,' said Margaret to herself. "'perhaps dropped by some old peddler while fording the stream "'before there was ever a bridge. "'But it's pretty enough in its way.' "'A more serious question than the value of the Atma "'was now presented itself to the mind of the girl. "'Her pocket was absolutely empty. "'She had walked all the way from London "'to procure an interview with Sir John, "'but she was now exhausted and footsore. "'And how was she to return? "'With a heavy heart and lingering step, Margaret Miles made her way to the turnstile again. "'If I could only get a little refreshment,' said the weary girl with a sigh, and she turned her gaze wistfully in the direction of a cottage, the only dwelling in view, which was the same as that from which aid had been sought by Mrs. Brown after her fall over the bridge. A pretty inviting cottage, it appeared, with ivy yet green mid the changes of autumn, "'clustering over the low porch and almost concealing the latticed window. "'A thin column of smoke rose cheerily from the chimney, "'and a ruddy gleam through the diamond panes "'told of a warm, lighted hearth within. "'Margaret drew near, as if attracted by the glow, "'and perceived, seated on a low bench within the porch, "'a young and pretty girl with a basket of work by her side. "'Her dress was of simple material, "'but made with an intention to style and the becomings, which caught at once the lady's maid's experienced eye. Glossy light hair, rather elaborately curled, fell on either side of a round, ingenious face, which only wanted an expression of more intelligence to be extremely attractive. The mouth was the one feature which the critic would have pronounced defective, always a little open, and whenever the maiden spoke or smiled, displaying too much of the pearly teeth, it gave an impression, even at first sight, of a character irresolute and weak. "'Might I ask for a glass of water?' said Margaret, addressing the pretty maiden. "'I have walked very far, and I am excessively tired.' Notwithstanding the shabbiness of Margaret's attire, her manner and her dress were by no means those of a beggar. "'I will fetch you some milk with pleasure,' exclaimed Annie, rising at once from her seat. "'Pray sit down on the bench till I come back. "'It is so pleasant with the warm sun upon it.' "'Annie ran into the cottage, carrying her basket on her arm. "'Margaret saw that it was taken in a measure of precaution, "'for her sharp glance had in a moment perceived "'that it contained something besides muslin. Four bright half-crowns, just received in payment for work, "'lay at the bottom of the basket. "'Annie soon returned with the milk.' and a large slice of bread and butter, which she offered with simple but grateful hospitality. She seated herself again on the bench, placing her basket at her feet and tearing off a strip of muslin, 
began laying down a hem as she conversed with her stranger guest. "'You taken work?' said Margaret in a tone of inquiry. "'Oh, yes. I've always liked work, and Mother says I've quick fingers at it. "'Have you much enjoyment in this place?' "'Pretty well,' replied the blue-eyed Annie. "'I've just made two dresses for Mrs. Wells up at the hall.' and she glanced at the basket containing the silver. "'The hall,' repeated Margaret, gloomily. "'I suppose that you were employed about Miss Allison's trousseau?' "'Oh, dear, no! That was all had from London. But when the poor young lady died of the fever, I helped to make the mourning for the servants.' "'Do you live by your needle?' inquired Margaret, after another little pause. "'Well, no. Mother sells poultry and eggs.' and she has the cottage rent-free, so she lets me have all that I can earn for myself, and nice little sums I make. "'I wonder,' observed Margaret, with a smile, "'how your mother can manage to keep a pretty girl like you at home.' Annie had laid down her hem, but did not seem disposed to take up her needle. She made no reply to Margaret's observation, but kept twirling round and round on her finger a very showy ring of yellow stones set in the form of a serpent. "'That is a very pretty ring,' said Margaret. "'Isn't it a beauty?' cried the cottage maiden. "'Bought, I supposed, with your earnings?' "'Oh, dear, no! It was a present from a friend!' The blue eyes sank under Margaret's look, and a rosy blush mantled the cheek of Annie. "'Ah, I understand.' said Margaret, knowingly, a friend who would like to put another ring on another finger? The rosy cheek dimpled. The cottage beauty gave a little conscious laugh, and glanced timidly round, without raising her eyes as if afraid that the observation might have been overheard. "'Whoever chose that ring was a man of taste,' observed the quondam lady's mane in the tone of one who knows what is what. "'And depend on it.' He is one who will show taste in things more important than the choosing of a ring. Annie simpered, but feeling perhaps a little uncomfortable at the turn which the conversation had taken, she reverted to the subject of her earnings. The mother lets me have what money I can get. Of course, most of it goes to make her comfortable here. Now I shall take a walk afore dark to the village and buy her some tea and loaf sugar and a new ribbon for her bonnet besides. I shall trim it without her knowing, and give her a surprise to-morrow. And what will you do with what money is over? Well, I don't know, replied Annie. I do, said the lady's maid, laughing. You'll buy a pretty little keepsake for the friend who gave you that ring. Well, I never thought of that, said the simple girl, drawing the yellow serpent up and down on her finger. It's so hard to find keepsakes for—for for gentlemen, that's true. There are not so many pretty things that they are able to wear, but breastpins are fashionable and genteel. What do you say to something like this? And Margaret drew from her pocket the atma, which she had rubbed as bright as circumstances permitted. La, that's pretty, cried the admiring Annie. But the silver don't look over good. It's an antique. A regular antique gem, quite a curiosity in its way, and reckoned remarkably handsome. Why, my grandfather, who was a coachman to a duke, always wore it when he drove his master to court, added the unscrupulous maid. La, now! exclaimed Annie, gazing with added respect on a jewel which had figured on such grand occasions. Just look how it shines in the light! "'You won't see such a breastpin as this on every day of your life,' said Margaret, speaking more truly than she intended. "'You wouldn't like to part with it, I suppose?' "'Well, I should need to be hard-pressed to do so,' said Margaret, with well-feigned hesitation. "'An old family piece like this. But I happen to be rather out of pocket just now, and I shouldn't mind for a consideration to—' "'I'll give you half a crown for the pin.' "'Half a crown?' repeated Margaret with affected disdain, beginning to feel the zest of an angler who had a silly fish playing around his bait. "'Half a crown? Why, it cost my grandfather a bright gold guinea, if ever it cost him a penny!' 
Annie looked disappointed. The difficulty of procuring the antique gem increased her desire to possess it. She lifted her basket from the ground and, drawing out two half crowns, proffered them in payment for the pin. Margaret felt half inclined to close with a liberal offer. Five shillings for a gigaw picked out of the water, which she did not believe to be worth as many pence, was a temptation scarcely to be resisted. But she looked at Annie's eager eyes. She saw that she had to deal with an ignorant, credulous creature. The cupidity of her own nature was aroused, and she determined to drive a hard bargain and wring as much money as she possibly could from the simplicity of the cottage maid. Margaret, therefore, shook her head at the sight of the two half crowns. Annie sighed, looked at the pin, then at the basket, thought of the tea and sugar and the new ribbon for her mother's bonnet. Margaret held up the gem so that it flashed bright prismatic tints in the sunshine. How beautiful it is! exclaimed Annie. Any lord might wear it, observed Margaret. It is fit for the crown of a king. Annie slowly, hesitatingly, drew a third half crown from the basket. Perhaps you would let me have it for this? she said with a doubting look. Margaret felt her fish nibbling at the hook, but it was not time to jerk up the line. It would be throwing it away, it would indeed, she replied. I could get more from any jeweler in London. It would please him so much, murmured Annie, scarcely audibly, fixing a longing eye on the jewel. Well, I'll tell you what. Said Margaret with an air of one who is resolved at any cost to do a generous thing. I'll let you have it for ten shillings, and that's a bargain, I can assure you. I can't afford to give so much as that. Oh dear, I've no wish you should. I only meant to oblige, said Margaret. And Margaret rose from her seat, tightened her shawl, and seemed in act to depart. I am much obliged to you for the sup of milk, and I wish you all happiness, my dear, and I hope that you'll find something to please as much as this antique gem. Margaret turned as if to go, but took care not to stir from the spot. It's such a love of a pin, exclaimed the regretful Annie. You'll not have another chance, said Margaret, moving a step, only one step, from the porch. You shall have them, you shall have all the half crowns, cried Annie, pouring the whole of her little treasure into the hand of her unscrupulous companion. Margaret chuckled inwardly at her success, but betrayed no outward sign of exultation. The exchange was quickly made, and the unprincipled Miles proceeded on the road to London, jingling her silver in her pocket, and laughing to herself at the credulity of the poor fool whom she had so cleverly taken in. Who is the fool? Who was the loser? Who is ever the loser when conscience is bartered for lucre? The deed of Margaret is repeated every day, every hour. It is repeated every time when, by falsehood or fraud, the purse grows heavy with unrighteous gain. Little cause have the winners to exult, little cause to rejoice, when they have thrown away the atma, the jewel, to secure the perishing riches of earth. Thank you for listening to Capitola Black Recordings. I hope you have enjoyed this recording of The Lost Jewel by Charlotte Marie Tucker. 